today I'll be covering um, actual projects, two actual projects. The first one is a steel composite eye girder bridge um, project. Um, it's a rehab um, construction. And some of the remarks is that this structure has a varying um, bridge width and there are additional girders joining. Um, second project is a pre-stressed concrete eye girder bridge. And um, some of the remarks is that the girder lies in transverse direction and parts of girders are not covered with the bridge deck. So the first project, as you can see, has the deck widening in the middle and also um, gradually throughout the whole um, structure. You can see further details in the framing plan as shown over here. That's the original, um, that's the original structure. And this is the phase two through five, there is a rehab going on. And as you can see um, um, in the phase two, the left end of the bridge is removed and constructed. And in phase three, the middle portion is removed and constructed. Phase four, the end portion is removed and constructed. And in each phase, um, the lanes are running in different um, directions. And some of the lanes, um, such as over here, uh, will have varying um, direction um, flow of the traffic. So the point, uh, the key point I want to cover here is that the construction stage was covered multiple times in other training sessions. But today I'll be focusing on how you could actually set up the moving load analysis that are different in each construction stage. So the discussion points for the first project is the manual modeling approach. Uh, steel composite wizard, um, so for this project, this type of irregular um, project, um, you could use two ways, either uh, model using the wizard, and, but then a wizard cannot handle varying deck, um, deck width. So you, you actually need to um, combine uh, multiple sets of model and modify from that point on. But the approach that I'll be showing today is importing the um, CAD file, um, either MicroStation or AutoCAD, and, and then modeling portion. The construction stage set up um, for the rehab project. Um, so um, basically how to set up uh, rehab projects and in connection to it, um, how to set up moving load analysis. Um, that's uh, for the ongoing um, different phases and the vehicles running in different directions and so on. So the second project is, as you can see over here, the bridge deck is poured through this deck outline. Uh, basically, these are Ohio um, pre-stress um, beam sections, um, the uh, wide flange 60 um, beam, and some of the, um, the outer um, girders, B1, B2, B3, actually have smaller sections. So for the significance in this one is that unlike a usual um, pre-stressed uh, concrete composite structure, this structure has the girders lie in the transverse direction of the, um, to the bridge um, direction. So I'm going to show how you could actually manage that, um, this type of irregularity. A little more details about the project. Unit one drawing and the second drawing. And the discussion points for the second project is that um, also the manual modeling, um, especially when the deck lies in the transverse direction. And here I will try to cover what are the things that you have to be careful when you try to import from the CAD uh, and vice versa. And the stage set up for the non-uniform deck pouring. So the deck isn't really poured for the entire girders in this example. So I'll be covering how to actually manage those type of non-composite portions and um, setting up, um, linking it to the construction stage analysis setup. So as you can see, um, this is the first uh, project example. Give me one second. Okay. 
Let me um, hide uh, the deck portion so we can see clear view of the girders and uh, the joining occurring. So as you can see, in this portion, the girder is joined. And in Midas, you can actually handle that without any problem because it's an FBA program and it's only a matter of drawing additional lines for the joining girders. And the diaphragm is also modeled using the beam element. And to provide a brief overview of the modeling approach, um, the girders are modeled using frame elements, I mean the beam elements, and the deck portion is modeled using um, plate elements. Details such as weldings or connections are not reflected in this model. It's more of a, a general analysis um, approach model. But as you can see with um, the plate um, diaphragm, um, the girder is connected to this um, beam and um, going through um, to the uh, forward direction, just like the, any other um, girder lines. Okay. For this type of modeling, um, um, there are, as mentioned before, there is a way to use the wizard and modify um, the model that the wizard creates um, quite uniformly. And the second way is to import from the CAD. So basically, in the CAD program, you can have uh, you can have different um, different part of the structure um, light in like this. And here, uh, what to make your life easier, what you have to do before importing into Midas is uh, you have to put um, different part of the drawing in different layers. So currently, I have five um, different layers. Um, bearings, I mean the bracings layer, uh, so, um, and the deck outlier um, line, outer line layer, and the girder layer and the transverse, deck, um, transverse element layer. So for different part of the structure, I actually assign them in different layer. So that way, when I import, so in this blank model, I already defined my materials and sections. Steel A36 and Steel A572 and the concrete for the deck, and the eye sections for um, the plate girder, and um, the rest of the framings and diaphragm sections. So when I go to the main menu, go to import, and go to AutoCAD DXF file, here I could bring a DXF file from the into Midas Civil. And here, as, you, as I mentioned before, since I assign different part of the structure into different layer, I could actually um, bring them, import them one by one. And right now, I actually assigned all the girder sections in one girder layer. However, I have multiple different girder sections. So either in CAD or in MIDAS, you can take your time distinguishing um, different girder, um, different part of the girder uh, with different sections. Or you could actually do the same thing in Midas after just importing them all together as a girder. Okay. So all my girders are just imported, as you can see. And also, I selected my material and section for the girder. So therefore, as I import this uh, line from, uh, from the cat that is assigned in girder layer, the girder section is applied at the same time. 
and um, I outlined exactly the way I um, extracted from the, um, the cat drawing. And then the transverse diaphragms. Also assigning the proper section for that area. I'm referring to um, the plate that the um, um, girder um, end is uh, attached to. Looking close, now the transverse, um, the end plates are imported. So this way, one by one, you could actually import um, different part of the structure like this. So that's how you could easily handle this type of irregular um, deck whitening or the girder, additional girder lines model um, um, like this. Okay, so that way you could import um, different layers one by one and uh, mesh, auto mesh the deck portion and finally complete uh, the modeling. And here the stage analysis is already set up. In the phase three, so this model is reflecting the phase three and four model. In phase three, uh, removal uh, wet. Um, stage. The wet concrete loading is applied to a part of the structure. And in phase three, dry, the wet concrete is actually activated. And in phase four, wet con um, phase four construction, wet um, stage, the wet concrete loading is applied. Um, and then the deck is poured for the rest of them. And this type of staging setup is possible because here. Let's go over the stage setup one by one. In phase three, so currently, um, as you saw, the decks, the bridge is kind of cut in half, and the deck is poured in sequence. And in phase three, removal, wet, um, as you can see, there are element tab, boundary tab, and loading tab. And in the element tab, you can actually activate a group of node and element. And in this stage, uh, the base framing plan is activated. And this group is actually including all of the steel um, bare members. And in phase four, and in phase three, I'll uh, remove uh, wet uh, um, over here. The wet concrete loading is activated for um, the phase three portion of the structure. And in phase three, dry, uh, the deck is actually activated and the rail um, in the end is also activated. In phase four construction, the wet stage, um, the um, nothing much changes in terms of um, not an element, but the wet concrete loading is activated for the other side of the bridge. And in phase four construction, um, once again, the deck portion and the rail portion for the other um, half of the structure is activated. And right now, I just uh, walk through how the stagings are composed. So now I just want to walk you through one, a little more detail about those groupings. So each time in this phase three, uh, removal, wet stage, 
the this part of the structure, I mean the entire um, the bare um, framing is activated. And in phase three, remove all uh, wet. The wet concrete is also poured. So different structure group. So this is the element group that we also saw in the construction stage composition window. And the boundary group, I kind of skipped this portion, but this is related to the link and support. And in the loading portion, uh, the wet concrete loading and the hunch loading and also the rail loading are put in different groups. So the stage composition was a matter of when you assign um, the proper group into the proper stage. So in the phase three removal wet staging, the base framing plan, which is also right here. And this group is including the, all the steel members. And in stage three removal dry, uh, the deck portion and the rail is activated. You can also find them over here, the left permanent rail and the left proposed deck. And let me actually show you in the model view. The base framing plan, let me activate this group. Exactly as what we see in the wet con um, phase three wet stage. And the left permanent rail and the left proposed deck portion is the concrete portion for uh, a part of the structure. Like this. In the same way, the right proposed deck and the right permanent rail are also um, over here. So this way, using different group of structure group um, that actually contains different group of node and element, you could freely compose a construction stage like this. And that way, this example model um, isn't actually covering the entire face and the entire part of the structure, but you could actually simulate this type of um, staging like this. And the second portion I wanted to cover for the staging and is the moving load, as I mentioned before. So for the moving load, give me one second. So the trick to the moving load is actually in uh, connected to the construction stage. So right now, as an example, I defined uh, four layers total. Okay. So the lane one, I'm zero, one, two, three, four. They are all lied in going from this way to that way. And as you remember, um, the, the phase three, um, in the phase three, the this left portion of the girder is, I mean, the deck is poured first. Let me. Like this. So in this stage, uh, we only have this um, example lane three, I mean two, three, four available and able to run in this stage. So among the five lanes that I defined, lane three, four, five could be running in um, the stage um, phase three, removal, dry. And for, for cases like this, I created two moving loop cases. One is for after phase three. And the second one is for after phase four. So the phase three actually has, um, okay, give me one second. Let me go over my moving load, um, all the detail first. So for the moving load setup, I went to the load main menu, have chosen the moving load load type, selected um, ASHTO LRFD moving load code, and I define my lanes, as you can see over here. The lane, I actually define the lane based on um, this outer girder line as my reference line to the lane. 
However, if the girdle lane isn't really um, parallel to uh, the reference line that you initially started with, feel free to define a, any type of like um, feel free to define an additional line that's going to be parallel to your girder. So that way, right now, um, if you see my lane zero, for example, it's actually running perpendicular to this reference line that I selected. But let's say the lane zero actually needs to run more in the um, um, in the vertical direction that I'm drawing. This way. One second. So if the lane needs to run that way, what you could do is uh, you can actually draw a dummy line that's going to be parallel to um, it's, um, that uh, lane that's, um, um, that's not actually parallel to the girder. So for example, in this case, if you want to um, draw a lane that's not perpendicular to, um, let's say, one of the girder line, you could actually draw a dummy line so that's parallel to uh, your lane locations. Go to create element in the node and element main menu. Go to create element here. Choose general beam or taper beam type. I'm going to choose just like a random number for the section in the material property since I do not really intend to assign any type of um, property to it. And let's say the lane uh, 0 is running in the direction that I'm currently drawing. Then create a dummy beam like this. So that way, when you compose the lane later on, you're not, um, holding, you're not actually holding this outer girder as your um, a reference line to the lane, but actually select this dummy line as your reference to as the reference to the lane that you define later on. But right now, I actually assume the lanes are running parallel to the girder uh, and, um, and simplified it. And this lane, um, you can actually, uh, so right now, and in this example, it says the maximum lane width can be 11 feet. But it can be flexible, um, it could be reduced, or the vehicle location may vary within the lane. Then when you define the moving load lane, right over here also, and also for this model, the deck is model using plate element. So that case, you could also use the traffic surface lanes. Um, for the model that you model the deck portion using plate element, the traffic surface lane may, um, it can be more accurate approach. Before this example, I just um, simply define the line lanes. So when you define your lane, um, pay attention to this portion. So it's originally um, grayed out like this, but when you check on this traffic lane optimization, what's, what it's going to do is ask you the lane width and also um, so yeah, the lane width. And what's basically happening and why the lane width actually matters with the traffic lane optimization option is when the traffic op lane optimization option is um, checked on, it's the program will float the wheel, um, the wheel locations within the lane. So that way, before the wheel is assumed to be running in the center of the lane, but now it's we are actually giving it the choice to float it within the lane. So this way, if the lane width may vary, uh, feel free to use the traffic lane optimization option and define the lane width. So within the lane width, the program could actually float the, um, the wheel on um, um, the, the vehicle load. And as you can see, um, element 500 through um, a higher number is chosen as my reference line. And as you can see in the model view, it's actually the red highlighted this girder element like this. And also, if there is any skew to it, you could actually define your skew angle to the traffic lane that you defined.
And traffic lane two, same, but actually um, with greater offset. So that way I could actually define the lane two, which is over here, further from the reference line. And pay attention to the moving um, direction. So if you are actually, so in this example, uh, we have the, uh, the lane direction um, decided. Or, so by default, the moving load direction is uh, considered to be both. But if you want to be more effective and don't really consider both cases, you could also eliminate the, um, define the lane to be moving in forward direction or backward direction only. So that way, um, you consider only one of the case. But normally, um, um, I mean, if, if the, um, yeah. So this way, you could also control the flow, um, the direction of the traffic flow um, using the moving direction option. For the vehicle, I simply define uh, my um, HL93 design and truck and the tendon. But you could also define any type of permit load. So that way, if you need the permit load running, uh, you could use um, this permit load too. And in the moving load cases, uh, here I composed um, two moving load cases, as I mentioned before. One to run after phase three, and another one to run after phase four. In the moving load case for after phase three, it's actually going to have three lanes selected. So remember lane zero zero and lane one right over here. There, um, it's now composite after phase three. Lane two through four are the part where the um, where the um, girders are composite. So in that case, I so for that case, I only selected lane two through four. So choose my minimum number of loaded lane um, possible to be zero and maximum number of loaded lane to be um, three and define this. And also define the truck load. So I have two vehicles to consider, the tendon and the truck load. And the same lane setup is used as the one before. So the two sub-loading cases are assigned within one main moving load case. And the second one is for um, after phase four. And for this one, um, after phase four, that's where the lane one and lane zero lies, um, it become composite. So I only just have chosen uh, lane zero zero and lane one to be uh, running in this um, example. Oh, actually it's going to be different. So. Um, this is what I initially thought, but now um, actually in phase, after phase four, the entire structure become composite. So this way, on top of lane zero and one, I mean two, three, four, lane zero and one will have to be added in addition to what we had already running in phase three. So change the maximum uh, number of loaded lane to five and leave the minimum number to zero. But then again, Um, after phase four, we have all the lanes um, can run the traffic. So instead of having just lane zero, zero, and one, I moved the entire lanes to be considered. And here we have different moving load case, uh, phase three and phase four. Just because we define them, it doesn't mean the program yet knows when to run each moving load case. So for that, you can go to analysis main menu, go to construction stage analysis control. And basically analysis controls are often um, um, disregarded in case you're running with a, if, in case you're doing like a simpler um, type of project. But in case you're doing a complex type of project, such as right now, uh, this analysis control um, functions could be really, really helpful. And as one example, I'll be showing you this one. So in the construction stage analysis control data, you could basically choose. So originally, the um, analysis control data setup will have the last stage to be the final stage. But right now in this type of project, we have to run moving load um, in two different conditions. After phase three, 
when one side of the deck is composite. And second time will be when the rest, the other side is also poured and the bridge is fully composite. So in that case, for the final stage, um, for, uh, for the phase, after phase four moving load case, where all the lanes are running, you can run the, you can actually set the staging to uh, end in the last stage. But in case, uh, if you want to consider this phase three moving load, you want to change your final stage to other stage and choose uh, that stage that you want to run the moving load analysis after. So if I were to um, you know, fully set up this model, I probably will have two models saved, one for um, after phase three and another one for after phase four. So for this model, I could actually end the staging in phase three and delete my fourth moving load case. And in the other model, I could actually save it as a I could save it as um, another model and end the final stage. Um, I mean, make the last stage to be the final stage and get rid of the phase three moving load case since we no longer need it. We only need to consider the phase four moving load case, which considered all uh, five lanes. And in the previous model, again, You could end your construction stage after phase three and delete the fourth uh, moving load case. I mean the after phase moving load case. But I'll leave it as um, whole as of now. So this way, um, different type of vehicle, um, the traffic lanes, um, you could actually set it up and use this uh, construction stage analysis control data and change the last stage to where you want to end your moving load. Um, by using this final stage function, the benefit will be you don't have to create multiple modal. You could actually end the final, you could actually change the final stage. But you could also save it as another modal for the phase three, when the phase three is completed and when the phase four is completed. Okay, so that was about the first project. And the second project over here. So for this project, I, I took different modeling analysis approach. So the first one actually had the deck portion modeled using the plates. So when you look into uh, the details of it, the plate portion, let me activate just the plate um, part so we can have clear view of the deck. So the deck is modeled using the plate. However, in this model, um, the deck portion is modeled using the beam element too. And for that, in Midas, you could actually use the composite type of section to model the deck portion and the girder portion at once. Okay. So to give you an overview about this model, uh, in stage one, uh, the girder one is casted. So the first set of the girder are casted first. And in um, girder two, um, the second portion is casted. And in stage three, the first part of the deck is poured. And as you, if you, um, as you um, hope you remember, give me one second. The deck is in poured for the entire part of girder one set, but it's actually poured partially. And in stage four, the deck is poured for the other side, but not really for the entire part.
So reflecting um, this condition right here. For this, I actually, um, I actually um, got the um, drawing from the consultant. So this was the original drawing. But in order to make it, um, you know, Midas friendly, I had to um, um, edit some of the information in this one. So this is the original drawing that I received. And in the modified drawing, I simplified it, but also added an additional component such as these um, transverse um, dummy beams. So in the original one, the difference was the deck outlier was modeled using the splines, like combinations of splines and lines. But I actually um, drew um, this deck outline um, using just a pure line element because um, splines cannot be imported. And also, this represents the intermediate, um, the, um, the um, um, diaphragm, the pier portion. But since we are going to use the beam element, I actually got rid of um, the other lines, but only used the center line to, um, to model it. So leaving multiple um, lines to represent you know, like each section, uh, one. So trim it down to one instead of multiple lines. And for trimming down, it's better to use the center line instead of the outer line. And the skirter is kept as uh, they were originally. And this girder, um, the deck outline portion, is drawn again freshly using the line element as mentioned before. And one thing that I added in addition to um, what that was already in in the drawing is this type, um, this transverse beams. So in the modeling, in the grillage modeling approach, you actually need um, transverse dummy beams. So when you look at the model. So when you look at the model, let me turn off the hidden view so we can just take a look at the clear view of the um, lines. So these are the girder lines. However, as you know, the, for the girlage analysis approach, both the girder and especially the deck portion is also modeled using um, the beam element. And beam element is only in one direction, one longitudinal direction. So when the deck is modeled using the beam element, what happens is the transverse, there's no, um, there's nothing that actually represent the deck in the transverse direction. So right now our girders are running in the longitudinal direction. Let me activate a part, a part of it so you could easily visualize what's going on. So for the composite portion, deck is also modeled using this composite section. And when I activate all, uh, here we go. Right now, what you are seeing is the screen uh, beams that are representing the deck in the transverse direction. They are indeed um, the dummy deck members, and they lie in the transverse direction of the girder in order to provide a transverse um, stiffness of the deck, uh, which isn't done uh, with the, um, the longitudinal members. And for this one too, um, I imported from the CAD. One second. So for this model too, you could import the specific layers that you want. And when you import different layers, uh, um, the benefit is um, the different part will be also kept like the layer setting. So before I had the girder center lines in one layer and the slab um, outline was defined in one layer and the transverse dummy deck beam was also assigned to a different layer. 
So this type of separation can be also considered when you import from the CAD. And this can be really beneficial when you try to assign different sections. So for, let's, uh, let me give you an example with the girder portion. So I'm going to define an additional section. First, I'm going to define a girder portion. And as mentioned before, this example has the Ohio um, um, wide flange um, precast beam as an example. <clears throat> so simply by going to the pre-stressed concrete tab and choose the pre-stressed concrete I section, choose the ODOT as the section name, and find the specific um, section that's already in my civil database. Um, define this girder section. Oh, give me one second. Let me undo this quickly. Uh, okay. And as you can see under my tree menu, uh, WF on um, the white flange 60 beam is defined as I click apply. And then now you can go to the composite section tab. And here, find the composite I type, which is for pre stressed concrete I uh, composite section. This is where you can define the deck and the beam together. So define the girder to girder distance, define the um, thickness of the deck. Define the hunch height. And for the girder portion, you can actually import uh, the section that's already defined using the database. So this way, I could model the composite section really quickly. And in order to consider the different material for the deck and the girder portion, uh, you could actually choose this select material from DB and provide a exact material for the girder and the deck portion. So this way, the program now, when it calculates the section property for before composite and after composite, it knows that the um, each portion has a different uh, material property. So use uh, this type of uh, modulus, uh, the modular ratio uh, for the girder and the slab portion. Okay, and here what I did is, uh, from this point on, I actually took a lot of time trying to define different um, groups. So as you can see right here, uh, in my completed model, um, I didn't um, entirely complete uh, model the, uh, the thing, but I actually completed model so I could set up my construction stage. So if you look at this example, I define multiple groups for the girder composite and non-composite, but let me show you some of the most representative ones. So I put the abutment one in one group, abutment two in one group, and going down, I put girder one in one group, girder two sets in one group, and peer in one group, peer one dash two in another group. And then I also define the transverse deck in one group and another group. And if you also look at the section, my list of sections, um, the W flange, the white flange, uh, white flange on 60 beam is assigned to the non-composite area. And the 11 is a composite, exactly the same as what I showed before, but composite with the deck portion. So if you look at it in 3D view, the part that I define just a beam, it's non-composite. And the part that I define with the composite section is actually has the deck running like this. And the part for the second two, second uh, portion two, composite, the purple lines, and the non-composite. So this way you could define, uh, you could distinguish the non-composite portion and the composite portion like this.
And how we set it up is when you go to the construction stage, I set up five, um, six different stages. Um, girder one is first casted. So the first set of girders and the second set of girders are casted. And the deck is actually poured actually for this in middle portion. The deck should be casted at once. But uh, when, I, um, when I work um, around for this, I actually um, casted them um, separated. But uh, in reality, they should be casted together, um, this portion. And in the deck one is poured, uh, deck is actually poured for this area. And then the deck is poured for this area. But in the actual construction, uh, the deck pouring is divided in this, um, this edge right here. Not really um, this way cutting um, sharp um, parallel to the abutment. Uh, it's actually um, poured and uh, casted uh, with, the, with this line as a barrier. And the composite short term stage is also defined in which um, the component, the additional component and the wearing loadings are applied. And in the composite long term state, not much change is made except the duration is over 10,000 days. So we could actually consider the creep and shrinkage effect. And when you, let me show you the stage set up one by one. The girder ones are casted, um, as mentioned before. Uh, the upper part of the um, here should be also casted in this stage since the, um, the girders are running um, continuous and casted at once. Uh, and girder two, the, the second portion, which is originally here in the real project, is casted in this stage. And the deck is first poured for the first part, should be up to here actually. And the deck two is also poured should be again from this point, not really um, cut in this way. And as I mentioned before, uh, the composite and the non-composite sections are defined. And when you actually look at the girder one or two, um, even the portion that I defined, the composite sec um, section, you don't really see the, um, the deck portion yet. So for the composite section, in order to define, uh, distinguish the compositeness for the construction stage, you use this function, composite section for construction stage. The girder one, so you can actually select the section, composite section, and separate the part one, the girder, and the part two, the deck portion, and have them activated in different stage. So the part one, the girder, is activated and girder one casted, the original state where you know these members are activated. But the deck portion, since the deck is poured later after the girder is casted, you can choose different composite state um, to be for part two. And also, um, this part was covered in the last training session in the post-tension um, box application example. But the age over here and the age is related to the time dependency of the material, um, compressive strength, and creep and shrinkage. So um, I won't go into too many too much detail since it's already covered. But the age uh, will strictly affect um, the, um, the the compressive strength uh, at two um, the a um, according to the age. And uh, the age will affect the creep and shrinkage calculation. And for this example too, uh, remember um, for right now our girders are running in the vertical direction. I mean the transverse direction. And the deck isn't really, um, you know, it's not really geometrically like perpendicular or parallel to the girder. You know, it's neither of the case. So in this case, what you will need to set up the moving load analysis is you will actually need to use um, this deck outline line, or you could actually draw a like a dummy beam that could be the reference line to the moving load analysis. So for example, if you want to use this outline as your uh, moving load reference line, you could actually use uh, this outlines.
like this, go to moving load. Use those element ID, define the lane width, and define the eccentricity. Find the link. And <laughs> Uh, right now, my lanes are defined, but there is an error. So the moving load is defined about this outline as the reference line. But um, if you have an uh, if you have an experience with the moving load analysis, this may be a common error that you will encounter. For this type of error, the reason is because uh, when you display your element local axis, it's actually different. It's not exactly the same. So if you look at this one. So if you look at the highlighted portion, do you notice the faint, uh, the green arrow? So the direction is actually uniform throughout the, um, the beams. But when you turn on your uh, local axis, the axis direction may not be the same. And also for this type of case, um, the exact cause of this type of error is the element IDs are not really in the incremental order. So right now, I define my lane to be covering this element IDs. However, um, the element ID that I inputted over here is in the order of increasing magnitude, but in reality, they're not really put in um, into the um, into you know like continuous um, incremental order. So for this type of error, when you encounter this type of error. What you have to do is you can actually renumber your element, go to not an element, go to renumber element, and renumber your element like this. Give it the new starting number and refresh. So this way, when you select your lane and copy this element ID, uh, this is now in the order of incre um, in in um, increasing. like this. And also, let's say this deck outline isn't really the necessarily the reference line that you need. You can nearly draw a new line, create a new element, make sure that you choose just like, you know, like, um, like the dummy material, um, and also the section that's very, very um, small and negligible. So the purpose is only to kind of locate the beam, but nothing further. So this way, if your lane is running, uh, not really necessarily strictly following the deck outline, or if you just simply need a new, you know, line, just create a new uh, line that can be the reference line to the new vehicle lanes. And same goes for the previous um, project too.
Okay. Um, this was up to uh, what, I, what I wanted to cover today. Uh, let me go over a couple questions and we'll conclude it um, soon. Okay, one of the question was um, when importing from the CAD, um, either AutoCAD, once again, MicroStation, is there a setting that defines the um, fineness of the model, such as node spacing along the girder? So um, when you import a CAD file, either you know station, MicroStation, or AutoCAD, uh, you could actually you could actually just you know um, so the node will be created where the line disconnects. So for example, in my case. For this example, um, this line segment is ending in multiple um, in multiple segment. So when you actually just see it, it seems to be ending here and here. But in reality, uh, I mean, what I did is I actually disconnect them multiple times. So it's made of multiple segments like this. And when um, when a line when um, this multiple segments are used. Each end of each line segment, um, that's where the node will be created. So that way you could actually control the fineness of your model, such as node spacing along the girders, the size of the beam, or even the size of the plate when you mesh uh, using the auto mesh feature. And the recording will be sent out to everyone. Um, there were a couple requests. And for the moving load analysis, the wheel load can be um, so wheel load uh, can be floated in transfer instruction, and the, but the lane itself will be fixed. However, um, I actually mentioned this in other trainings. Um, right now, um, as the second improvement, you could actually float the lane in the transverse direction. However, um, but then the lane itself cannot be floated. But what will be um, changed um, in by the end of December is the moving load, the entire floating, even with the lane, will be available. So that's the third improvement that we're actually bringing um, to Midas Civil um, for the second um, update um, in this year. So right now, um, the lane itself is fixed, but the vehicle is floated. But in December, the, you can all you need to define is the vehicle width and the vehicle type. I mean, the lane width and the vehicle width and the vehicle loading. So that way, the program could actually perform the entire floating. And as the conclusion, 